Welcome to Lossy Mouth Baptist Church. Oh, good evening, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you, and um, you're welcome to the service. If anyone is watching online, then you also are very welcome. It's, it's good to be back here this evening in the house of the Lord and to come together to worship the Lord our God. As I said this morning, I, 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 changed, <laughs> I changed what I was going to say, but um, I'm just going to read the verse that I was, I was going to talk about this morning, and it's from 1 Peter, and I found this very encouraging, um, and I hope you find it encouraging, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Isn't that lovely? We're God's special possession. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And I hope you find that as encouraging as, uh, as I have done. Um, I hope you picked up a bulletin, um, or have received a bulletin. Um, the various items in there are good to be used as prayer, prayer points throughout the week. Um, I, know I said, well, I didn't say it, I forgot to say this morning, somebody, um, Liam, I think, said it, that um, on the 11th, we're having a, a church meeting on the 11th of September. Um, but uh, there'll be more information about that coming on um, later. Um, and just to remind you that Rebecca and Chris are still having ongoing treatment. And Janelle is, is, was admitted to hospital this week. There's Christianity Explored on the 30th of September, so we need to pray about who we could invite to, to that. And uh, I will read again the announcement that we made this morning that Alastair has made us aware of his desire to step down from his role as treasurer and from the leadership after 12 years. We're very grateful to Alastair, who has done a fantastic job in this role. It's not an easy job, and Alistair has always been prompt to make payments and clear and to clear and clear in his church reports, which we're very grateful for. We're also grateful to Foster, who has agreed to take on the treasurer's role on a temporary basis um, to give us time to consider what the longer term plan for the treasurer will look like. Let's just come to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just come before you, we just ask and pray, Lord, that as we come to the start of this service, that our minds will be focused upon you. Lord, we just ask and pray that you will help us to just put aside any, any matters that will be detracting us from concentrating upon you. Lord, we just pray for those that are unwell at this time. We think of Janellen in hospital. We think of others, Lord. We think of Rebecca and Chris as they continue their treatment. And for any others, Lord, and again, we just bring them to you, Lord, by name of those that we know. Lord, we just thank you that you hear our prayers, that when we bring our prayers and our, our, our concerns and so on to you, you hear and you answer. And we're aware, Lord, that there could be people that we don't know of that are in need of your touch upon them tonight. So, Lord, those that we've named, those that are unnamed but you know of, Lord, we just pray that you will just Put your arm around them tonight. 
Give them the comfort. Give them the peace. Give them the healing that they need at this time. But above all, Lord, just give them the love, your love. Lord, we're just so grateful that you consider us a special possession. Lord, and we just thank you for your, your love for us, Lord. And we're reminded that you loved us before we loved you. And uh, we just thank you for that, Lord. And Lord, we come before you. We thank you for all the work that Alistair has done over the past 12 years, Lord, and the dedication that he's had to that work. And we just ask and pray that you will be with him as he, as he perhaps seeks further opportunities um, to, to help within the fellowship. And Lord, we also bring Foster before you as he, as he takes on the treasurer's role, albeit on a temporary basis, Lord, and we just ask and pray that you will just be with him as he grapples with the finances, Lord. And Lord, we also pray too, Lord, we just thank you for the visit that we had last week from Deborah, Lord, and we just pray for her as she is uh, on her way to South Africa at this moment in time. Lord, and, uh, and that she will be there for a, a children's international conference, Lord. And uh, we just pray that as she meets with other people involved in children's ministry, that there will be good, good experiences to, to, to share with one another. But also, Lord, we just pray too that towards the end of the week, as she flies to Madagascar, the place that she talked of as being home. Lord, we just pray for, <clears throat> we pray for her as she goes back there to settle back into the work, the work that you have for her, the work that she's been doing so faithfully, Lord, and we just ask and pray that you will be with her. And we pray too for her parents as well, that this is a, sad, a sweet and yet bitter time as they said goodbye to Deborah this morning, Lord, in the knowledge that they probably won't see her for another two years. But Lord, we know that they will also be comforted by the fact that she's in your hands and that she's doing the work that you have for her. So Lord, we just pray for Deborah, for Gail and for Andrew. And Lord, we just come now and we just bring this service before you. We ask and pray that you will use Liam in a mighty way tonight as he opens your word. Lord, let us be, be worshipping you by sitting and listening to you speak to us through Liam. And Lord, we just come and we just thank you for all your goodness to us for everything that you have done for us, Lord. We just ask and pray that you would just accept our praise and our worship. We just ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you, Paul. Okay, let's move into a time of worship. Please, would you stand with us?
you know, the Lord is in charge of everything, right? He's all sovereign. Maybe this moment is just for us to pause and maybe we're not directly singing words. I'll just play. Lift up your prayers to God. Let's just spend a moment. Let's be still before him.
Good evening. It's good to be uh, out together again tonight to look at um, continuing in our series in the book of Ephesians. And tonight we're going to be looking at three verses. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 4, verses 7 to 10. It's page 977 in the blue book, in the blue Bibles in front of you if you're using one of those. The Word of God says this, but by grace he's given to each one of us according to the measures of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and gave gifts to men. And saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Amen. Short reading tonight. Let's pray as we look at this passage together. Lord God, our desire tonight would be that we would be in your presence. And our desire tonight would be that we would hear from your word and hear you speak directly into the situations of our lives, of the places in our lives where we want to hear and we need to hear from you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the wisdom, the, the wisdom that, that Paul was given in, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write Ephesians, for what you have to teach us tonight in these three important verses as we come into this next section. Would you encourage us? That, Lord, I do pray that tonight as we look at this, this idea of the gifts and the grace we've been given, that, Lord, every single one of us who knows you as our Savior would be encouraged and excited to serve you because of who you are and because of what you have freely given us. So bless us as we come um, into your presence, to this passage, Lord, encourage us. In your precious name we ask, amen. <laughs> Paul's word to the Ephesians was not just a challenge for them, but it was a challenge for us as well, a call for each of us. He urged the church early in chapter 4 to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that we've received. And it goes on, what does that look like? Well, he's called us to walk in humility and in gentleness and patience, bearing each other in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And what we've been looking at in chapter 4 so far is not just nice ideas that Paul's given us, but these are commands from God. And, and Ephesians is so beautifully written that it was intended for every single church and every single generation to be able to live out the glory of God. But we wonder, in, in the things that we've been listening to and reflecting on in, in Ephesians 4, we might wonder, how are we actually supposed to achieve any of the things that Paul has set out for us to be? What has God given us to enable us to walk this way? How have we been equipped to live out this high calling that, Christ, that, we're, that we're called to live in Christ? What are the resources he's given us as a church to build one another up? Well, we see Paul's answer to these questions. We see that in, in, in verses 7 to 16. Uh, but tonight I want to look specifically at verses 7 to 10. In this section of Ephesians, it's powerful because we're given insight into God's vision for his church. It shows us what the, the church should look like. It's not about a few people doing all the work, but it's about each of us playing a vital role in building one another up in love, all for the glory of God's kingdom. And these are three verses Paul reminds us of the authority of Jesus and the power that he has and he's, by his grace, equipped us to fill, fulfill the mission that he's called us to. And as I've said already in my prayer, I hope tonight that we're really encouraged by this passage. Every single person 
who's redeemed by Christ, brought into his kingdom by his grace, you have a crucial part to play in the kingdom. None of us have been called to be spectators, but equipped uniquely by Christ to contribute to the life of the church. If you've ever wondered whether or not you fit in or belong, you've questioned what your role is in the life of the church, this passage, I hope, will give you comfort and assurance that every one of us matters and has a place in God's kingdom. When you look at Ephesians 1 verses 1 to 16 in its fullness, Paul has called us in unity as followers of Christ. Not a suggestion, but called us to embody the very heart of God in our relationships with each other. I want to just refresh that. Verses 2 and 3, we, we see that unity isn't something achieved through force or manipulation, but born out of humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing one another up in love, and making every effort to keep this, the, the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. And this is far from easy. It requires us to lower ourselves, serve one another, and prioritize peace in our hearts. And in verses 4 to 6, Paul's laid out the foundation of that unity, reminds us that, that there is one body and one spirit, just as we're called to one hope when we were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. What he does is he grounds the, the, our very unity in the nature of God himself. We're not just a random group of people tonight trying to get along. We're one because God is one. And Paul, he doesn't stop at unity. He, he shifts gears in verse 7. He says, where he says, but the grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And that button there is, is crucial for us because Paul is saying that we are one in Christ, but don't mistake unity for uniformity. There's beautiful diversity in the body of Christ. Each of us has a different gift, those gifts meant to build up the body, to strengthen it, and to help us all be more like Jesus. This isn't a contradiction, though. Unity and diversity aren't at odds with each other. They're two sides of the same coin because God designed it that way. He gave us different gifts, different strengths, different roles, but all of us have been given those things for one purpose— to glorify him and build up the church. So we mustn't only embrace our unity, but there is an embracing of diversity in God's church too. Because the truth is, we all need each other's gifts. We all need to know how to learn, how to, how to love each other, serve one another, even in our differences, because that is when Christ is at work in the church. We come together united in Christ, diverse in our gifts, and we reflect then, when we see the diversity of the church, the fullness of God. And that is, a, and that is an important truth that this world needs to see, isn't it? The church that is diverse, but works together for the glory of the kingdom. Not a fractured or divided church, but a body that functions as one. Loving, serving, and glorifying God together. Every single one of us, as I've said, as followers of Jesus, by the gift of the, by the Spirit, we've been given a gift, and Paul calls this grace gifts in Ephesians 4, 7. This isn't just some vague idea, it's real and personal to every single one of us. Paul says that the grace was given to each of us according to the measures of Christ's gift. So again, I want to say this just in case you don't believe me. Every single one of us, without exception, has received something special from God. And when Paul uses the word grace, he's, he's pointing to something crucial. And that word grace in the Greek is charis. And it's the same word we use when we talked about um, the grace that saves us. Ephesians 2, 8 uh, and 9, where it says, For by grace you've been saved. That's charis grace, unmerited favor, grace that we didn't earn. And that same grace that saves us is a grace that equips us. It's like God saying, I'm not only going to save you, but I'm going to equip you to empower you to be part of the kingdom and my plan. 
But these gifts, as they come from Christ, uh, by the Spirit, these are not gifts that are ours. They're not rewards. You're not receiving your gift because you're smart or talented. They're given gifts. We're given gifts that we don't deserve. They're pure gifts of grace chosen by God in His sovereignty. He decides what gifts we've been given, and He does it for the sole purpose to build up the body of Christ. And here's something important for us to remember, too, that God doesn't make any mistakes. If you've ever found yourself wishing that you had someone else's gift, maybe you've thought you've got the the wrong end of the stick in the gifts that you've been given. I want to gently encourage you that that's not the right perspective. Because God in his perfect wisdom gave you exactly what we need or what you need to fulfill your role in the body of Christ. If you don't have the gift you think you you should have, it's not a mistake, but that is grace. The gifts given to us is given by grace, God knowing exactly what we need to fulfill our role in the kingdom. And so we, we need to get also we need to get rid of the idea that, that some gifts are more important than others. Paul makes it clear that all gifts are essential, necessary, and valuable, even the ones that we don't see as much. And if you think about your, your own body for a second. No, there's parts of our body that that we never see. There's organs inside of us that we know of, but are absolutely vital. I was having a a conversation this week with with somebody about nose hair and eyelashes. I won't give you the context of that conversation. But I don't know if you've ever realized how important your nose hair is, stopping the dust from getting in. And if you don't have nose hair, then you just sneeze and sneeze and sneeze. The same as eyelashes. They're not just things um, to... To, to beautify, but these are essential for protecting your eyes. Maybe you've not thought about how important your nose hair is before, but it is vital to the body. And just as there's no spare parts in your body, there are no spare parts in the body of Christ. Every one of us, the moment that we were saved and brought into relationship with God, was given a gift of grace. Something to hold on to, something to be thankful for. You might not have a gift that puts you right at the front, but that doesn't mean your gift isn't important. In 1 Corinthians 12, 7, Paul says, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Your gift, whatever it is, is crucial to the role of the church and maintaining its unity. So I want you to remember this tonight, that God has given you a charis grace gift. And that gift is needed. Don't underestimate it. Don't compare it to anyone else's. Use it to serve the body, to build up the body, knowing that God, by his grace, has equipped you in his sovereignty and in in your uniqueness, and you play a vital role. When you see in the scriptures what the, the, the scriptures say about spiritual gifts or the gifts of the Spirit, there's, there's something consistent that runs through every single passage in the New Testament that you see about gifting. And that is love, unity, the body of Christ, and the glory of God. And these aren't just random themes that have been picked out in the, in the New Testament. They are at the heart of why God has given us these gifts in the first place. When Paul and the other New Testament writers talk about spiritual gifts, they bring it back to that core purpose. They're not there to show off ourselves, to elevate ourselves. God has given us gifts of grace to build up Christ's church and to glorify him. Think about it this way, for example. If you've been given a gift of of hospitality, for example, or a gift of mercy, No, these aren't just personality traits that you've been given. These are supernatural gifts of grace empowered by the Holy Spirit for a specific purpose. God has equipped us with these gifts to strengthen and unify his church. Every single one of us has a gift and God has given by grace to each of us uniquely at least one gift to contribute to the life of the church. And the flip side to that, I think, is really important too. That it means that not any, any one of us has all the gifts. 
Not one of us can do everything. And God has done that by design. He doesn't intend any of us to be Christians and do faith alone. And Paul illustrates it. I've alluded to it already in 1 Corinthians, but 1 Corinthians 12, 14 to 20, he talks about how the body is made up of many parts. And it says, the foot can't say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body. And the ear can't say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. If the whole body was just one part, where would the rest of the body be? God has arranged the members of the body, each one of us, as he has chosen us to be. And this is the way that God has intentionally designed and planned it. The one who gives us the gifts is the one who does it perfectly. If we were all the same and we had the same gifts, the body would not function. We need each other and we need the diversity of the gifts given by grace to make the body of Christ complete. And coming back to Ephesians 4, in and, 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 and verse 7, we see that grace has been given to each of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Again, I say God hasn't given you this gift because we're particularly talented or good looking. These are God-given, supernaturally endowed gifts. Straight from the Spirit by His grace. And so God prepares you and gifts you and opens those opportunities for you to use those gifts for his glory. And our role in that, as we, as we all know that we've been given gift of grace, and by his grace we've been given gifts to serve with, our role is to faithfully step through the doors that God gives us to serve him. And there's something deeper here. Isn't, isn't that just the goal of the Christian life? To serve and to glorify God in who we are and what he's made us to be. And similar to what I was saying this morning, it starts with a desire to be used by him, recognizing that whatever gifts we have from God, they are meant for his purpose and not ours. And when we surrender our life to him, we see in, in love how we can build up one another in the body of Christ. And then you see purpose, you see fulfillment in that calling because God has given it to you. And I think we see purpose when we live out what God has equipped us with and we serve him with. Recently, during, during Magnitudes, when I was away with the, the young people, um, some of them were asking me about my calling into ministry. And I thought, and, you know, thinking about that for, for our passage tonight, it was quite helpful to share. You know, when, it, when, I, when I left high school, to, uh, I left high school right away and studied theology at the Bible College. But all the way through my school years, I had a very clear plan of what I was going to do. I was going to go to university and study music. And there was no room for God in the midst of the plan that I had for myself and what I was going to do with my life. And then just before I went into to my final year of school in S6, I was deeply convicted at a scripture union camp that I went to. And the, the, the camp was about submitting yourself to the plans and purposes of God's kingdom. And I realized that for me, I'd, I hadn't consulted God in any of what my future would look like. I was really convicted that I didn't give him any space for what my life would look like. And by the grace of God, when I seeked him, my attitude became far more of him and less of me. That was my prayer. And by the grace of God, my attitude changed in, in terms of the plans of my future know that I had to decrease, so he increased. I prayed, Lord, here I am, send me. And for, for, uh, that, that sounds quite holy, but for many of my family who aren't Christians, that was not a particularly uh, hopeful um, statement to make because they didn't understand um, throwing away most of what I was planning on doing with my school years. They told me I was being ridiculous and, and so on. But I remember during a, a, a careers assembly at school, um, for those of us who hadn't applied for university or college or an apprenticeship, we were asked a question. We were asked the question, what are you passionate about? And I prayed, Lord, what do you want me to be passionate about? And I, and I heard a, a clear voice in my head, and it was, it was far greater than I could ever articulate. That's how I knew it wasn't my voice. But I just heard clearly, 
you're passionate about seeing people change by the grace of God. And then three weeks later, I had an opportunity to apply to be a youth and children's intern in a church. Um, and I was offered this role for nine months, and I was there for five years. And I was able to study theology. I became an ordained Baptist minister. And in those, in those moments, what I had to have was a willingness for God to use me. And in every opportunity, I took that opportunity that he opened. And there was a lot of humility in the midst of that. If you asked anybody when I was 14, 15 who knew me if I would be preaching tonight, they would have said, no chance. In fact, I was once called out by my pastor for playing a game on my phone during one of his sermons. And uh, not, not too long ago, um, I got to preach and he was at, at the church when I was preaching. And he was laughing at me for that. But the difference was between Liam back then and, and Liam who was convicted by the spirit of his plans for, for the future is that it started with a willingness to seek God and let him change me. Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This doesn't mean if you desire something, God gives it to you like a wish granted. It means that when we delight in the Lord, he plants in us his desires for our life. He gives you the desires that you have and he equips you to fulfill them. And when you delight in the Lord, your desires are given because you align yourself with him and the greatest purpose that you can ever have for your life, which is to love him and to serve him. And maybe you, as you're thinking, your, your gifts are tied to the desire God has placed on your heart. But along with those gifts, the things that God has given us, there has to be a humility and a willingness to say, Lord, I will go where you want me to go and I will do what you want me to do and I'll be who you want me to be. And when God gives you an opportunity, be ready, equipped by his grace to step in and to serve him. These are grace gifts which you have not earned. They're not about making a name for yourself. But these are gifts that God has given you, equipping you for the unity and the building up of his kingdom. For you to live a life changed by his grace. That's the invitation that God has given us. Gifts which aren't just random abilities that we've been given, but given by the sovereignty of the Spirit of God. 1 Corinthians again, 1 Corinthians 12, 11, it's made clear that the Holy Spirit is the source of these gifts. We have not manufactured these on our own, but it's the work of God in our lives. Paul says in our passage, Christ who came down from heaven and then ascended back to heaven, didn't just leave us to figure these things out on our own, but sent the Holy Spirit who not only dwells within us, but has given his gifts to his people. And then Christ gave those people, each of us, a unique gift to the church. And this is how we build up the body. Gifts not built for our own status, but built to be used in love, in gentleness, in meekness, in patience, to glorify God. And this is something that we cannot understate. The purpose of these gifts are an outward focus for the strengthening of the body. And Paul touches uh, when he, qu he quotes from Psalm 68, verses 18, in Ephesians 4, 8. When he ascended on high, he led a, a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And in this verse, what Paul does is he draws imagery from this psalm where it, where it speaks of God ascending on high, leading captives and um, giving gifts among, receiving gifts among men. And um, when you look at Psalm 68, verse 18, if you have it in your Bible, and then you look at Ephesians 4, 8, the, the connection might at first glance be a little bit challenging. But it's really rich in its meaning, and I want to share that with you. The Psalm that Paul quotes might initially, it, it seems about David's conquest, his triumphal return, and, and in a triumphal return, you then, and after a war, you distribute these gifts. But this um, Sam is also a reference to God as the ultimate warrior, conquering his enemies and giving gifts. 
So Paul is using an, an imagery of, of a conquering king. In the Roman world, there was something called a triumph, where there, there would be a massive military parade after a war. After the Roman general conquered an enemy, he would come to the city and triumph. There would be a massive street party, and they would show off the spoils of the war and distribute these spoils to people. And Paul is using, drawing on this metaphor, Christ um, he, he draws on it to make sure that Christ is shown as the ultimate conqueror who's defeated his enemies and in his victory he has distributed gifts to his people. And he doesn't just leave it there. Verses 9 and 10, he goes deeper into this quote from the Psalms, but he directly applies it to Christ. In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. That's a, a tongue twister, isn't it? Try and say that three times fast. Paul is teaching something here profound. He's showing us that Christ didn't just come down uh, from heaven to, to earth. He came to the lower parts of the earth. Christ left the glory of heaven to experience life as a man in the fullness of the human experience, and suffered death, buried, descended into the grave. But as we know, the story doesn't stop there. Christ doesn't stay in the grave. Christ rose from the dead, ascended back to heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, at the place of ultimate authority and power. Jesus is a triumphal conqueror who came from heaven to conquer sin and death. He conquered the grave ascended back into heaven in victory and seated on the right hand of the Father. And we're told he's coming back again in full power and glory to establish his kingdom. I think it parallels beautifully Philippians 2 where Paul writes, having this among yourself, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who th- who though he thought he was, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed him the name that is above every name, so that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. In Philippians, we see a similar pattern. Christ, who is in the form of God, emptying himself, taking on the form of a servant, humbling himself to the point of death, and God exalted him. The ultimate example of humility, leading us to glory, and the gifts that we've received in him, is one who is a king that's triumphant and glorious, And also I want to remind you too as we think about these gifts of Acts 2 where we we see the disciples see Jesus ascend to the right hand of the Father. This moment, it, it, it led to the day of Pentecost. And Pentecost is really significant for many reasons. But the one I want to highlight for us as we think about Ephesians is the day of Pentecost was the birthday of the church. On that day when the Spirit came, not just to make a brief appearance, but to permanently indwell and regenerate those who were saved by Christ, to make something entirely new. For the first time, people were not temporarily touched by the Holy Spirit, but permanently sealed by the Holy Spirit. And not only that, but the Spirit equipped the early church with the gifts to build up the body of Christ. And we too are given those gifts. Think about the importance of that moment in, in, in Pentecost in Acts 2. When the church was born, it was not built or born by, by the disciples and their plans and their tactics or schemes, but the church was built by the sovereign work of God through the work of the Spirit and by His Spirit equipped His people to build up the body, to build the kingdom. And the work of the Spirit equipped the the early church and equips us in a way that we could never do on our own. 
So here's what I want you to understand tonight, that this incredible outpouring of the Holy Spirit where these gifts came, they came at a great cost. Our salvation and our ability even to have the gifts that we've been given, to the ability to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to build up his church and to be a part of his kingdom is brought at the great cost of Jesus dying on the cross. Through his atoning work, we've been made new, equipped with his gifts given to us, all of which play a significant part in the, in the role of this church, if we think about how the church's history all the way from that day of Pentecost to us meeting today, equipped the same way by the Holy Spirit. But again, I challenge you, with those gifts, we are always to strive in love and unity for the glory of the kingdom. Whenever you think that your gift is about you, you have misunderstood something very important about the gifts given to you. Because it's not about us. It's never about us. It's not about our ambitions. It's not about our desires. It's about the glory of God. It's about his power. It's about his kingdom. I want to be a part of that kingdom because that kingdom is going to be for, for now and forever. That is a kingdom that I want to be a part of. The Holy Spirit didn't come on the day of Pentecost to make much of us. The Holy Spirit came to make much of Jesus. Came to glorify the Son, to empower us to live lives that reflect His love. But also reflect His unity. And reflect His truth. So our challenge in, in just three short verses is one, to remember the gifts that we've been given, that all of us have an important part to play in his kingdom, to use those gifts in the way that he's called us to, never to use them for our own advancement, but to build up the church in unity and to build up the church for his glory. I hope you're encouraged tonight that each of you have a vital part to play in the kingdom. Each of you has been given a gift by God. And God doesn't make mistakes in what he has given you. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for that simple truth that, that you never make mistakes. And I thank you, just Lord, I have a heart to just thank you for everybody here tonight. I think for everybody here who, has, um, who knows our gifting and has served you faithfully in this fellowship for many, many years. I thank you for those who have recently joined. Lord, for those who you've recently saved by your grace, we, we again just celebrate and rejoice for how you save us. Lord, help us to understand with confidence that, that we belong to your kingdom and that you've given us the, the grace gifts that we need to live out your calling. Heavenly Father, I pray that in any way, if any of us would use our gifts in a way that's about us and not about you, that you would help us to realize. Lord, if we make plans and we make uh, rules for ourselves, which is not of you, that get in the way of your plans for us, Lord, I pray that you would remove them. Lord, would we leave tonight with your encouragement that, that whether we do a, a job that none of us sees or we preach from the front, Lord, that every single aspect of the life of this church is important and precious and vital to you. And I pray, Lord, that we would use our gifts in unity and in love and in humility of, for one another. Lord, I pray that this church would be built up because every single one of us knows that we have a vital role to play in it. That all of us are vital to you and all of us are important parts of the body. And I pray we would see our lives changed because we have purpose in you. I pray we'd see our lives changed. We'd see our church just grow from strength into strength because we, we seek you and we, we love you. And we want to serve you in what you've given us. 
Encourage us, Lord. Meet with us as we recognize what you have given us. Nothing that we can do of ourselves, but only you can do. And we ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Our next song is um, reflecting that uh, mindset of uh, the disciples at Pentecost waiting on on God's arrival and and whatever God's next move was going to be. So uh, just picture that in your mind as we come and sing this one together. With faith to move the mountains, let the mountains move. We have come with expectation, we are waiting here for you. Amazing love. 
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. It's been a pleasure to bring today's message to you. And as always, we hope that if it has been a blessing, you can share this message far and wide through our Facebook page or Instagram. You can also find out more information about LBC through our website at www.lossiebaptist.org. Take care.